Beth, could you please start by stating your name, spell it for us, uh, tell us which agency you're with, and also your title there. I am, my name is Beth, B-E-T-H, Rossman, R-O-S-S-M-A-N, and I am with the State Office of the State Attorney, 18th Judicial Circuit in Vieira, Florida, and I'm the Director of Victim Services, Witness Management, and Community Alliance Programs. Okay, thank you. Well, we're going to start out with sort of an obvious one, and that is, what brought you to the field? What got you involved in the criminal justice movement in the first place? Well, believe it or not, I graduated with my criminal justice degree back in 1980, and about the same day I graduated from college, I started at the Brevard County Law Enforcement Academy, one of four females in my police academy. And the day I graduated from the police academy at noon, I started at the Cocoa Beach Police Department as one of their first female police officers at 4 o'clock that afternoon. So that started me as a police officer, but I was literally working the road as a regular police officer. What now, did you come to the field because you were sort of assigned to it, or was it a special interest of yours, or, or how did you end up down that road, so to speak? Well, for a lot of reasons probably, but a lot of it's just through default, I think. Oh. Um, being the first female, you can imagine that when there was a homicide, who'd they call? Okay, well, let's call Beth. You know, she's got that female perspective. Um, and we had a condominium collapse down on top of itself after I'd been there for just a few months. And of course, again, I always tell people, being the first female, what do you think they had me doing? A lot of people say, oh, directing traffic, when indeed it was actually working with the families. And I laugh and say, I wish I could go back and help those people. I was 20 years old. I'm sure I traumatized them to death. I mean, I'm sure they're traumatized for life because I didn't know what I was doing. So I had spent six and a half years at the Cocoa Beach Police Department. I worked my way up into the detective bureau and was a everything from a decoy prostitute to working uh, homicides. So I did just about it all because it was a small department. And then in 1986, our state attorney was elected, and one of his campaign promises was to start a victim witness unit. And he asked me to come to his office. He came to me and recruited me because I had been, again, that first female, been out in the community a lot, and um, people had been very good to me. And he asked me to come and start his first division. As a police officer, I'm still a certified law enforcement officer and have been for now for 22 years. And so that's when I started. That's how I got, kind of went in by default. Bottom, bottom up, too. Bottom up. Right. Um, well, uh, harking back, you sort of mentioned your, um, your start there. Could you tell us sort of um, how you viewed the field or what was the field like when you first got into it versus sort of how it is today? Well, I think it was in, in the state of Florida, and that's one of my first frames of reference, obviously. We had Janet Reno. Um, Janet Reno was a wonderful advocate in Dade County and I really looked to that program to give me a lot of information. Um, um, I went down there. There was not a lot of state attorney's offices, maybe just a couple that had programs in their office. So I really looked to the shelters, to the um, rape crisis programs. There were f just one in our county was all volunteer. Mm -hmm. Really kind of looked to them to try to give me a start. Did a lot of reading, did everything I could. And my boss, who, again, ran on a platform, Mr. Norm Wolfinger, ran on a platform of victim services. That was his whole thing. So it wasn't just a matter of starting a unit for me. It was that we had to train everyone from the secretary to the highest paid attorney in our office. Everyone does victim services. We all do. We have a unit, but everybody's involved. So that was a real unique approach. So I went, he sent me to the, my first NOVA conference in Denver. Um, and the first time I saw Norm Early, who was then the prosecutor of Denver and a board member of NOVA, get up and speak. I was hooked. I thought, gosh, these people are they're doing what I need to be doing. And, and then um, Dr. Marlene Young got up, and I thought, oh, my gosh, there's people out there that have all this information. And this was back in 1986, so it hasn't been that long ago. But um, I found such a, a comfort on a national level that um, I soaked up everything I could get. But it was, it was very few and far between in the state of Florida. Uh, well, what did you find out as sort of a, a pioneer, as, as you mentioned, both in the um, law enforcement arena but in the larger field as well? What were you finding were your greatest challenges early on? Well, it was a new field. And the first thing that I found was that the prosecutors didn't want anything to do with it in our office. Um, they felt like it was interrupting their cases and why should we consult the victims? They're really just witnesses. And I think one of my very first challenges was getting them to believe in the program. And my theory all along, and, and victim services is only one of the many things that I do now in the office or one of my divisions, but is that if you can show them that you're not going to give them more work, you're going to take work away from them, 
that they will naturally become involved. They'll naturally just, anybody, anybody in any field would say that, oh, somebody coming to take my job, some of my work away from me, yay. And it was the same thing for law enforcement because we not only do the cases that are brought into the state attorney's office, but we do cases that are just out there with no arrest because we don't, we have limited services in law enforcement and always have. Um, so we're a 24 hour day program in a prosecutor's office. So that was, the challenge was getting law enforcement to call us when something happened, getting the prosecutors and the judges. I mean, I can't tell you, and I still battle these people all the time. The judges are continually the probably one of the worst areas that we have. I found that to be one of the greatest challenges. But again, I think that by showing them that we're going to take some of this work away from you, we are going to do this. And also, having the support of the state attorney, he literally said, you will do this. Um, and I can tell you that there have been attorneys, there have been secretaries, there have been investigators in our office that have been suspended because they didn't contact the victim. So I mean, even though that was a challenge, he was right there boasting me the whole time. Um, the other thing was getting them to be honest with victims. I found that was an incredible challenge because, and I'm sure it was this way in other states, but they would go out and interview a victim about a case and they would tell them, oh, and they're gonna serve 20 years in prison. The judge is gonna give them 20 years. Well, we knew that that was just a bunch of baloney, that they were gonna give them two, they would maybe get 20 years, but they'd serve two. So it was getting the attorneys who, who would tell me afterwards, I would say, why, why did you tell that victim that? They're not even gonna get close to that. They're not gonna actually serve that. And they're like, well, we just don't wanna hurt their feelings. And I understood that, and they meant that from the heart, but it was educating them, and it was a continual education process for them to learn that you may be hurting them, but in the long run, you will save them. You know, you will help them. You've got to be honest with them. That's part of what we do here. That's going to be our new thing in this office. We are going to be honest with victims. And really getting them to treat them, call them back. You know, you get, you know, let's face it, not all victims are angels. Some of them we call our victims from hell, and I know everybody has them. Um, and, and, you know, people want to know, and they want information, and it was getting them, people to talk to them. And, and so on an office issue, it was, it was quite a challenge, but again, my thought was if I could work 24 hours a day, which I almost did there in the first few years, they would see that this is serious, we mean this, and if she's going to work that hard, then maybe we should do something. Well, you may have partially answered this question, but what were some of the, the tactics or secrets or strategies that, that you used to deal with some of those challenges or maybe some of the challenges that you didn't particularly mention? Well, I think for me, one of the secret challenges was, I, and I still do, I, I work directly for my state attorney. And so I had an inside track to him all the time. So if an attorney or a secretary in the office or a law for, or a chief of police or a law enforcement officer would say something that would be really ridiculous or horrible or do something, I had his, his ear and he acted immediately. I mean, and harshly if it needed to be. So, I mean, that was really just, not every victim advocate program has that, and I continue to have that to this day, and it's, it's very fortunate that he has put victim services and the unit um, up to that level where it's a daily conversation with him, um, which I found was very helpful. Um, some of the other things I felt helpful, I mean, I would bribe. I mean, I literally would bribe, such as when we were having trouble with um, our crimes comp collection. The judges weren't ordering in the state of Florida, it's $50 per case that's ordered into the crimes compensation trust fund. And they weren't doing it, and our statistics were low. So at their judiciary meeting, I sent them the most expensive sheet cake I could possibly get my hands on that said, don't forget crimes compensation, the 50, and you know, worded it right there on the cake. And although it's that stupid, but it was little things like that that just continually pushing it in their faces. Um, you know, I would have meetings with anybody that would meet with me. I mean, it wasn't something that we just tried to do by policy. It was actually, you have to get out there. You have to, you know, knock on every door, talk to every person, uh, and they've got to constantly see you, and they've got to constantly say, oh my gosh, here comes that Beth Rossman again. She's after us about something. Um, I can remember working on a homicide case with a victim, and it was a horrendous case, and I was at the sheriff's department in one of our counties, and the detective who was working the case, who I had known for years, was just really being ugly to her, not wanting to give her information about the investigation, not wanting to tell her anything, and I said, okay, we're gonna stop right here, and he's looking at me like, what are you talking about? 
I said, we're going to the sheriff because we're not going to do this. And he said, no, we're not. And I said, oh, yes, we are. And I picked up the phone and I called the sheriff. He immediately took all three of us into his office and he told his detective, you will tell her this information now. And although that hasn't made me real popular over the years, but I'm also a law enforcement officer, so they can't get away with a lot. I mean, I understand the system and what's going on, but I, it was probably pretty harsh in the first few years, but, but I tried to do it as diplomatically as I could, and people knew it only came from the heart, so. Right. Makes all the difference, mm -hmm. top down hell. Um, well, you've already mentioned a couple accomplishments, but I was wondering, could you think about um, sort of your, your uh, own work and, and perhaps the larger movement and uh, tell us a little about what you view as perhaps your greatest accomplishment and maybe what the greatest accomplishment of the movement is as well. Well, I think where the movement's concerned, which I obviously would love to talk about much more because I don't know that I've had any individual ones. It's always been team efforts. But I think the movement, the, the presidential task force, to me, in my mind, even though it was really before I got into the field, to me that was just such a critical step in where we needed to go. Um, it was actually a group of people on that task force that, that everyone respected universally pretty much and it really gave some some solid answers on where we needed to go and I think for me it was one of the first documents that I read and it just felt like okay well I can pick up the flag and we can go forward and I think where the state of Florida is concerned for our movement in the state it was the fact that we took on the constitutional amendment on our state level and we passed it and we were the first state, us and I guess Michigan, mm -hmm. the first states in the nation to do it. And we did it by old fashioned stumping pretty much. I mean we literally went obviously from legislature to legislature just to get it on the ballot. But then it was we went on the mashed potato circuit mm -hmm. which is all the rotaries and all those mm -hmm. things, the Kiwanis clubs. Mm -hmm. But we also on election day stood out there with signs. I have pictures of us standing out there with you know vote yes on amendment two and mm -hmm. We were out at every street corner in the state of major consequence and every polling place. I mean, it was such a neat team effort. And, you know, we passed it within the 90 percentile. I mean, that's just amazing. Um, so to me, as a state, as a movement, that was so critical for us. I mean, and, and having that, um, you know, so I, I consider that one of our greater accomplishments in our state. But then just seeing the evolution of the enabling legislation that would say, okay, well, we have these rights, but what does that mean? A victim can get up and say, okay, I want to be heard now. Um, and it was really coming together as state entities, whether it was nonprofits and um, prosecutors' offices and law enforcement agencies. And we came together as a group and we wrote the enabling legislation for our state. Um, and to me, that was just, you know, that's a living, breathing document that our state has. So that was a great accomplishment for us. Um, I think. We continue to, my well, and it's a concern I have, but we continue always to look at how our state looks at VOCA monies, and, and that's come such a long way, and how they, you know, award crimes compensation, constant battles, but it's there. Um, and, of course, on a national movement, I am a firm believer in the crisis response team, NOVA's crisis response team. Um, having, I felt like a little black cloud followed me around for years because I told you that we had a condominium collapse, and then the shuttle exploded, and that's in my community. And we had that community-wide disaster. And then I started at the state attorney's office, and we had a lone gunman go through two neighborhoods and two shopping centers killing eight people and wounding hundreds of others. And we had another community-wide disaster. And that's really where I got involved with Nova's crisis response teams. And, and I am a true cheerleader in that effort. And I think that the effort of many, many people has just been incredible and the, the thousands and thousands of people's lives that have been touched by the crisis responders around this country. Um, you just can't talk enough about it. And the vision of pioneers in that, which were more than Dr. Young, Dr. Marlene Young, there were many people, but certainly she was the, the, is the heart and soul of that. Um, it will, you will never be able to tap into how many thousands of people that that has assisted over the years. Um, so I consider that and being a part of that from not the ground floor but early on and um, certainly I'm the coordinator of the state team crisis response team, the Florida crisis response team now, um, to me it's just been a monumental accomplishment both personal and as a national movement. Right. Well I want to get back to that too as we uh, get towards the end of the interview. But I was wondering, um, we talked about some of the accomplishments. I'd also be interested to hear about the other side. What, what is, you, did you consider either in, in your own work or the work of your agency uh, a failure or something that remains a challenge out there? And I really, to me, in my mind, one of the things that remains a challenge is always going to be the judiciary. 
um, and I'll go come back to that, it is always going to be keeping the passion in this movement. Um, but, but mostly to me, where I look at it, the judiciary continues to be a stumbling block for us. Um, th for the most part, there is no, and I, and I can only speak for the state of Florida, our judges are elected and they run four-year terms like a lot of the rest of us, or the rest of the elected officials do. But the bottom line is they have no challenge. No one ever challenges them. Rarely do you have a nut, somebody wanting to run against a judge. And we've got judges on the bench that literally don't appreciate victims' rights. They don't want to learn about victims' rights. They will say things that are just so incredible. Um, and unfortunately, we don't always have those agencies out there that are willing to take them on. And from a personal perspective, I work for the prosecutor's office. If I took on a judge for everything he said, they're going to null pros and drop and, you know, kill us. Um, in court if they feel like we're after them. So it's almost like you need somebody out there and that's a continual something that we've not accomplished and and they're getting away with things that are just so horrible and set the victims movement back 20 years by one thing that they could say and the bottom line is victims look I mean they we can work with a victim for four years and the prosecutor can and law enforcement and victim advocates um, but if a judge says something good to them, they will always remember it. That will be the person that they will say, thank you, judge, for doing that. They may never thank anybody else. And the fact that, that judge has so much power um, is frightening to me, and I think it's something that we've really not done a good job of. Mm -hmm. I know early on in my career, I went down to a judge's conference in Key West. You'd think it was going to be a wonderful, idyllic vacation as we went down there. And... Um, I almost got egged off the stage by the judges. Literally, they booed me um, just by virtue of talking about victims' rights. That was in the, the mid-'80s, I guess. But it was horrible. Obviously, a lot, a lot left to do there. Um, what else is needed? What is, what is missing in the field? What do we need as uh, an impetus to continue our movement forward, both in terms of, of services but also uh, professionalizing ourselves as a profession? Well, and again, I, I continue to say the fact that we need passion. You know, we had, there was so much passion early on. And a lot of those people with passion are getting ready to come to the end of their careers. And God bless them that they get to retire. I mean, um, I want people to retire. Um, but I don't know that I see as much passion with the people coming up. And, and somehow we, some of the old timers, need to really work with the newcomers to get that passion to know that it, Yes, it is a profession, but it is still a movement. Um, and that we have constantly got to have that fire lit inside of us to keep it going because I don't see as much of that. I also think that we as agencies and networks and um, consulting agencies out there and governmental agencies out there, we have got to find a way to continue to move forward together. Um, I am, again, somewhat new on the national scene as, as far as working in victim services, and I have a concern when I hear things like, well, this agency doesn't get along with that agency, or this person doesn't like this person, and therefore we can't work together. And, and that's, a, that's a big concern that I have. I mean, I don't understand why we can't get together. I mean, we may not always agree, but we need to move forward. Um, and we need credentialing. I mean, we need a field. I mean, I hate to say, I don't think we need to be unionized, um, although I'm a big union person. Um, but I, we need professionalism, we need credentialing, we need um, degree programs to get people involved on a university level. Um, but we need ourselves, we need to find a way, I mean, in many offices around the state of Florida, and I'm sure it's this way all over the country, um, people, victim advocates are just barely above a secretary. And not that a secretary is, you know, I don't mean it to sound like they're on a low level, but the bottom line is we need to be considered as a professional. And, um, and I don't know that that's, that's happening all over the country. And I think credentialing degreed programs will help us get there. And of course, we need a constitutional amendment. We need to get that passed. And I know there's brilliant minds uh, working on that as we speak, but we all as a movement need to get behind it. And I, and I am as guilty as anyone for, you know, I've got two legislators or two senators that don't necessarily support the constitutional amendment. I should be living on their doorsteps pretty much. Well, you're a veteran in this movement, but if you were to have a, uh, a newbie, someone who's coming to the profession maybe uh, for their first year, and you had them in 
sit down and, and they asked you, what, what would you want to tell them? What advice would you give them uh, to help them along in their profession? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I would tell them to always be honest with the victims because if I've made mistakes personally in my career, it was also of not being necessarily as honest as I should have been because it was hurtful or sad. Um, that victims will always find out when you don't tell them the truth for whatever reason. Um, I would tell them to work from their heart because it is a profession and there are right and wrong things to do but the bottom line is if you work from your heart and you think about the right thing and you think about how you would want to be treated um, and you try to give them the information that they need. I mean I think that that's that's so much of it. I worry for this profession that we are getting so caught up in red tape um, and bureaucracies now that we aren't back there on the level where we're just giving them service and we're working from our hearts. I mean, we want to be professional, um, but I don't want us to get to a point where we are so institutionalized that we can't break through that to help somebody. Well, and you may have mentioned this. Uh, my next question is, what is your greatest fear? Is it the red tape? Is it that we're, we're becoming too institutionalized, that we're, we're losing our heart? I, it really is, and I, I look at it from, from many perspectives, but um, when I look at the VOCA cap and, and the way our destiny is being controlled by people that have little knowledge about our field, that concerns me. Mm -hmm. um, when I think about even in my own state, in the not so much in the early days, but in the mid-90s when we would have changes in leadership, when our governor would change, when our attorney general would change, and we would find them shifting around crimes comp and VOCA and it would be going oh, the governor doesn't want this anymore. He wants it to go to the attorney general's office. And one of probably the most unpopular things that I did, and I still pay for it to this day, actually, is that I really went and lobbied hard with the governor of the state of Florida at that time and the attorney general because I didn't want them in the same place. Because I felt like we would have no checks and balance on this at all. If you give in state government someone all of the authority to give out VOCA grants, to give out crimes compensation, to do all your training, to certify you, to credential you, you have created such a monstrosity. Who's, who's watching them? I mean, and I don't, I trust my leaders, and I have, and we've been very lucky, but my concern has always been when, will we, get, when we get someone in there that we don't get along with. I mean, what's going to happen? I mean, it's going to turn into this huge red tape bureaucracy. And that is fearful to me. Um, and so I always, somehow we need to keep a checks and balance on, it, on these things. And, and I don't always think that that, that occurs. Okay. Um, what do you see as, as your vision of the future of this field? Um, again, you know, my vision is to be professionals, that everyone would be considered as professional that before someone could start providing victim services that they would have to have some sort of training and I definitely would like to see everyone credentialed whether that be in their first year of service um, and I say credentialed I don't mean just go through a course and once you get through three days of training yay hold up your right hand you're credentialed I want to know that you understand crisis intervention um, that you have some knowledge of the criminal justice system, even if you're working in a nonprofit, because crime victims, many of them, go through the criminal justice system. Um, I think that that is lacking, um, that there are some sort of standards for who can become victim advocates. Um, so that's important. Okay. Fair enough. I know you had a special role in, in developing some of the organization, particularly at a state level there in Florida. Um, state networks are, are almost in every every state now, but I'd be curious to know what your experience is. What were the challenges? How did you overcome uh, the inherent difficulties of getting people to work together, particularly at a state level? Well, I was very lucky. When I came in in 86, our state, or the Florida Network of Victim Witness Services, which is our state organization, was already developed on the backs of a lot of people, such as Greg Novak and um, Meg Bates and Laura Knutson, and there were so many of them that had been in the field, probably five or six, and Paul Freeman. Um, that had been in the field for a lot longer than I had, that had started it. And again, I came in as somewhat of a radical probably because I came in, again, just really pumped up and ready to go. So I'm sure they looked at me and just went, oh my gosh, who is this woman and can we get rid of her? Um, but the Florida Network has played just an integral role, I mean, in the development of victim services for the state of Florida. And the network... It was, it was not difficult getting people involved. I mean, we really, in, in the 80s and, and through the 90s, you, it was a competition to get on it. Um, and 
people work together and it was we the only problems I guess we had was getting too prosecutorial based where we really needed to watch ourselves and make sure we were geographically spread anyone will tell you that lives in Florida that Miami thinks they are their own state and deserve as everything that they could possibly get their hands on so we had to keep Miami in check to very often and tell them no you don't get 50 percent of the VOCA funds um, <clears throat> but the network has acted as somewhat of a um, a watchdog um, and I think it's been very effective. Uh, it also certainly started the first crisis response team in, in Florida which was big um, and worked very hard on the constitutional amendment and the enabling legislation. We continue to this day to work on legislation. People wanted to be on it and it was really neat in the early days because I can remember just being in so awe of these people. They were just like legends when I would read all the literature and pamphlets and things as I was trying to familiarize myself with the field. Their names came up over and over, and I'm forgetting um, the gentleman that now lives out in Colorado that was whose daughter was killed. Bob Preston. Bob Preston, you know, um, Bob Wells. They all started in Florida. Actually, even Nova was incorporated in the state of Florida. So Carol Sheridan, and there's just really some neat people, and getting to meet those people were just incredible. So Florida was doing a great job before I ever came around. I just was lucky enough to get to play a part in that. I am a past president of the Florida Network and continue to remain on the board today and they've just I can't say enough about the people we've got a great organization I'm very proud of it that's good that's good you said crisis response has been a, a major part of your professional life could you tell us a little bit about um, what your experience has been with that as a general concept and then maybe specifically in terms of the attacks in New York and here in Washington DC again I I'm not sure whether it's because I'm a law enforcement officer um, or why but again when I talked about the fact that in you know 1980 this condominium collapsed down on top of itself and that was my first exposure and I traumatized those people so bad and I probably didn't do much better after the shuttle exploded because what they asked me to do after the shuttle exploded the Challenger exploded was my job was to walk the beach and pick up parts of the shuttle um, because they were washing up on the shore because that is our bread and butter in our county um, the Space Center and who, you know, you can imagine the people I encountered down on the beach. They were people grieving. We all witnessed it with our own eyes. And so again, I think it was a result of that that just got me so incredibly passionate about the fact that we need to help these people, that we've got to be able to tell them that they're not going crazy. These are some of the things that they can expect. It goes back to that whole information and knowledge base, I guess. Um, and so, we sponsored uh, uh, the first Florida crisis response team and it started out with 40 people and now it has about a thousand. Um, so that's been a major part of my life because you can imagine not only responding to different things in the state of Florida because we have lots of disasters if you haven't noticed. If it's not Hurricane Andrew, it's fires, it's tornadoes, it's hur you know hurricanes and shootings and um, and you know to me I think our state, we are so proud of that in our state, and we're so proud to be a part of NOVA and be an affiliate of NOVA's. Um, we have taken that, and it, it's just been a tremendous effort, and I think that people are so excited about it. And But it's been also a lot of work because we've had no funding for it. So we've literally run it out of our prosecutor's office for, for many years now and funded it. Um, so that's been a unique challenge, but again, my state attorney is very dedicated to it. Um, after, as a result of that, certainly NOVA put me on their crisis, their national crisis response team and have been lucky enough to be a trainer, which I probably enjoy more than anything in my career at this point, is just training and getting people excited about the whole concept. Um, and the materials are wonderful that we use in the training curriculum um, from Dr. Young. We, um, as a result of that also, I guess, I've responded in many, many places around the country and certainly Oklahoma City when we were there I, I got dispatched to Oklahoma City within about a half an hour to an hour after the bombing um, and went there and spent two weeks at what they considered ground zero at the federal building there and trained and worked with victims and watched a lot of teams come in and out and I stayed and was very exhausted after that and I guess literally we thought that that was the biggest thing that was ever gonna happen I mean we thought this is it we will never see anything else like this we had done the granddaddy of them all we can all kind of just sit back now, do the, the, the crises and the disasters as they come up, which we continue to do over those years. And 
And then when September 11th happened, and I've told a lot of people this, the first thing that I can remember when it happened, we all have our memories, was just being exhausted immediately because I knew what was coming. I mean, you didn't even have to, to say it. I knew. And, and sure enough, I knew, you know, it wasn't within a couple of days that I was driving to New Jersey um, and working with the New Jersey government and setting up the Family Assistance Center with them. And, and so that was really my role on the first team was to, to work with New Jersey and the government and the Port Authority Police Department, get those, help Ed Neckel with those teams and getting those up. Um, and really getting the Family Assistance Center, which I think is, is going to be a legacy. Um, and I'm very proud on a personal level, but my little itty bitty team that went up with me, we worked hard to help get that established. And I think that the role that Nova Crisis Responders had with those 10,000 victims that came through that center is a lasting memorial. And I'm very, very proud of that as personally, but more proud of it on an organizational level. Mm -hmm. um, we worked hard to get that done. and. And it's just a great thing. Um, I went back and ran the Family Assistance Center after I went home, took a break for about a month, collected my uh, energy level again, went back for another 10 days, ran the Family Assistance Center, went home, and, and meanwhile through that I'm coordinating teams out of Florida because we sent over, um, over 120 people to New York from Florida from our teams. Um, so I had to make plane reservations, make their hotel reservations, debrief them after they came back. So you can imagine, for about the, a one year, my life was just consumed with 9-11. And I, I don't think people realize that it takes a lot to coordinate all this. And, and, um, and you can't just let people come back from these things and say, okay, now go back to work. You know, we had a long process of debriefing each one of our team members, debriefing them as a team as they came back. And I'm really proud of the effort that Florida, Florida had in that. Um, and then back in about two or three months later, I went back to Ground Zero and worked um, at, the, at Ground Zero in the um, respite tent and around the perimeter and took a team up there from Florida and worked with the construction workers and the police and firefighters and actually was there for the six-month anniversary. Got to see the two beams of light lit. And um, I can't say enough. I mean... NOVA's response to that, and I, I am a big cheerleader, obviously, of the National Organization for Victim Assistance, but mm -hmm. their response to that um, will not be written down in probably a lot of history books, but there are thousands of people that responded there for NOVA that had that memory and know who they served and the work that they did, and they have just, were incredible. We were so lucky to have so many wonderful people around this country to do that. What would you say were the most important lessons learned during that experience that might help us deal with a uh, um, disaster of that magnitude in the future? Well, the first thing that I would say, and, and again, I am biased and I re recognize that, but I, I feel I kn from a personal perspective that I know what I think works. <laughs> but um, we were completely not prepared for it from national organizations. As we tried to come together, um, I heard a lot of things said that I just couldn't believe. Well, the, it would be like putting out a... Um, if we can't send teams up to New York, it would be like putting out a, a forest fire with a garden hose. This was what another national organization said. We were completely unprepared to work as many national organizations to try to come up with a solution. And that was very sad that we were not ready for that. I believe that NOVA was. I mean, and NOVA got a lot of flack and people said, oh, you can't send teams up there. What are you going to do? Well, what are we going to do? Are we going to sit back here on the telephone? and talk about what we should be doing? Who's helping those people that are standing in line at the hospitals waiting to find out if they can find a loved one? Who's helping those people that are standing out there with signs of their loved ones? I mean, come on guys, we're all victim service professionals. These are victims of crime. What are we gonna do? And I think that was aggravating, but again, I just thank Dr. Marlene Young and the other people at NOVA and, and our volunteers because when the call went out for volunteers, people weren't scared, people weren't concerned about their own safety. People said, this is what I train to do, this is what I do every day in my job, and if you need me, we'll go. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, people will, it, it's, it was just an incredible response. And I don't, but I think on a national level, national organizations did not work together and that was very sad big moment in all our histories. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything you would like to add for posterity, so to speak? Anything we haven't had a chance to talk about that you feel it's important for others to 
to think about and remember as they look back on, on this social movement, the victims' rights movement? Um, and I'm sure there is. I think, I guess if, I, if people watch this or listen to this, I would tell them that once a year hear a victim speak, once a year um, take care of yourself, but the bottom line is don't ever let that fire go out because we are still a movement and will be for quite a while and we need every bit of passion that you have. Thank you, Beth. Thanks, Dave.